Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem and we are with Neelam Path Lectures, the Palm Series, which is practical aspect of law medicine. As you are aware, all our lectures are available on YouTube. We also have a Telegram group which you can join, which is very helpful for accessing all lecture related information. We have a Google Drive where the PDF of all lectures are available and a master integration key by which you can navigate between the drive as well as the YouTube. These are the disclaimers have here. We would like to specify that we do not sponsor any company, group, or organization. Reference to any particular brand is purely at the discretion of the presenter, solely done for understanding and explaining the subject. We do not subscribe to any brand. So we are with phase three, which is recorded pathology lectures. And today we have Palm 06, and we are streaming from the famous RG Cor Medical College and Hospital. And today's topic is common endogenous interference in clinical laboratory and to talk on that we have Dr. Sharlishtha Choudhury who is an MBBS MD from Ames, New Delhi. She has a diploma in health and family welfare from New Delhi. She's an assistant professor in the department of biochemistry at the famous RG Corp Medical College and Hospital. She is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Applied Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine member medical education unit at RG Corps Hospital, member scientific committee of RG Corps Hospital, technical assessor of NABL, and has published various articles in various national and international journals. With this, I would request Dr. Sharmishta Choudhury Ma'am to start her lecture on a very, very important topic, which is called the common endogenous interference in clinical laboratory practice. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I, Dr. Sharmishta Chaudhary, welcome you back to the practical aspects of laboratory medicine. In the third segment of this module, we will be discussing the common endogenous interference in the clinical laboratory. Now, this is not such a rare occurrence. Interference is very commonly seen and particularly there are three major sources of interference. One is if we go by the extreme left hand side that is the clear serum sample sans any interference the one next to it is an icteric sample that is the interference here is by bilirubin the one next to it the red colored appearing sample is one of possible hemolysis so the interference here is provided by hemoglobin and the last one which is milky white in appearance that turbidity is most often caused by lipemia and that interference is usually by the triglycerides, particularly by the chylomicrons. Now, what is the definition of this analytical interference? Analytical interference is classically defined as the effect of a substance present in the sample that alters the correct value of the result and is usually expressed as either concentration or activity for that particular analyte. This was the definition given in the year 1994 by the American Association of Clinical Chemists. So what can be the side effects or the outcome of such interference? In a single word, it is a poor patient outcome in terms of repeated testing, in terms of incorrect diagnosis and in terms of incorrect treatment. Now, what are the types of interferences? Either they can be exogenous, that is interferences from some materials which are not uh, expected to be found naturally in the human body or they may be endogenous. Now today's discussion we will restrict to the endogenous interferences mainly. Now what are the endogenous interference? Hemolysis, lipemia and icterus these are the three most common. In addition, paraproteinemia is another common source of interference, particularly in patients having plasma cell dyscrasias. Exogenous interference include poisons, drugs, herbal products, and other miscellaneous items. Now, coming to the first and the commonest and the most problematic source of endogenous interference, that is the hemolysis. Now, what about hemolysis? What is hemolysis? This is a process of release of hemoglobin and other constituents of erythrocytes. Mind you, it is not just hemoglobin alone. Even the other constituents of the RBCs, they, once they are released into the surrounding plasma following disruption of the erythrocyte cell membrane, that process is known as 
hemolysis and it may be of two types in vivo which is unavoidable or in vitro which is avoidable in vivo means that this is taking place inside the human body as a result of some pathology pertaining to that person and that is unavoidable it is a part of a disease process the in vitro hemolysis is one that usually can be avoided because this involves rupture of the rbcs after collection of the blood and this is very much avoidable so what are the chief causes of in vitro hemolysis one it can be due to very rough specimen transport rough handling of the specimen it can be due to faulty processing of the sample incorrect storage temperature of the sample it is also patient dependent in some patients who uh, they do not follow the instructions they move their hands the during the process of collection it may lead to hemolysis or their rbcs may be fragile as a whole it depends on the operator that is who is handling the sample and also it is often device dependent so what are the key differences between the in vivo hemolysis and in vitro hemolysis how can we differentiate between the two because that is very important as because in vivo hemolysis is inherently an unavoidable condition we cannot do anything about it so in in vivo hemolysis the serum haptoglobin is reduced whereas haptoglobin levels are normal in in vitro hemolysis moreover in urine free hemoglobin is often found in case of in vivo hemolysis but this would not be the case in in vitro the serum indirect bilirubin is raised in in vivo hemolysis because of excess load of the broken down uh, rbcs and the more and more hemoglobin that is released more and more bilirubin would be produced from it but nothing like that would be seen in case of in vitro hemolysis there is increased reticulocyte count in in vivo hemolysis but nothing of such is seen in case of in vitro now coming to the causes of in vitro lipemia in vivo lipemia if the patient is having some hyperlipidemic condition which cannot be controlled that is beyond our control also but what are the common causes of in vitro lipemia the commonest cause is improper time of blood sampling we have not advised the patient or the patient has not followed our advice correctly with regard to fasting and in non fasting condition they have come and given the blood so the dietary lipids that is the chylomicrons they are still very much in the circulation and as a result the sample is turbid due to the inherent presence of the chylomicrons which have imparted that turbidity or the second reason is sampling too soon after administering parenteral lipid emulsions this is very commonly seen in case of the ccu or the iccu patients who are getting total parenteral nutrition and they are getting intralipid solutions directly into their veins now what is happening is that the sampling is done too soon after such a huge load of parenteral lipid so naturally the sample which we are getting in the lab is very turbid absolutely milky white in appearance and the analytes which are sent for cannot be assayed because of the interference caused so we have a guide to the severity of hemolysis which is known as hemolysis index which actually gives us an idea a fair idea about how much hemolysis we can allow and to what extent our test would be affected by the presence of such hemolysis because in some cases if the sample if it, the resampling cannot be done it is a very precious sample we may need to work with a hemolyzed sample also but that is usually never advocated presence of frank hemolysis is usually a very gross rejection criteria so far as sample acceptance is concerned now we can classify the hemolysis to no hemolysis at all in which the appearance of the serum would be a nice straw colored yellow and the free hemoglobin level would be equal or less than 5 mg per dl which is negligible in case of mild hemolysis the gross appearance of the serum would be yellow to light orange you can take a look at the picture the picture is quite self explanatory the free hemoglobin level in this case would be 25 to 50 mg per dl in case of moderate hemolysis the appearance would be orange to red with the free hemoglobin between 50 to 200 mg per dl and in case of severe hemolysis the appearance would be brown to even frank red with the amount of free hemoglobin being equal or greater than 200 mg per dl so what are the analytes which are affected by hemolysis the analysis which are unaffected by hemolysis so long as the hemoglobin is restricted up to 6.6 mg per dl 
that would include albumin estimation by immunonephelometric method estimation of amylase calcium chloride cholesterol choline esterase creatinine iron glucose glutamate dehydrogenase phosphate sodium total protein triglycerides urea uric acid quite a long list these would be unaffected whereas even with mild hemolysis we cannot absolutely do the the following analytes that is ldh ast potassium acid phosphatase creatine kinase alt of which ldh ast potassium and acid phosphatase are absolute no no because ldh ast and potassium acid phosphatase is a very common constituent of the rbcs themselves so even with mild hemolysis erroneously high values would be obtained that is false high values would be seen for a patient samples and then there are analytes where bilirubin alp and ggt where the interference by the hemolysis actually masks their true value and we get erroneously or falsely low values for these analytes so we can't do them even with mild hemolysis so how does hemolysis actually interfere by additive nature so it adds to the signal in case of ldh ast and potassium since rbcs themselves contain these analytes they will lead to false high values then dilutional effect in case of sodium chloride and calcium so that will lead to a dilutional effect and that will lead to a falsely low value cross reactivity in case of adenylate kinase pseudo peroxidase activity of hemoglobin and cross linked hemoglobin so they would cross react with the analytes of our interest and spectral interference that is the absorbance given by the analyte of our inter wrist and that of hemoglobin would cross react with each other not that the analytes themselves would be reacting with each other but the wavelength would be common so hemoglobin has a strong absorbance at 415 nanometer so all other analytes which are measured at 415 nanometer they would also undergo interference now this is an algorithm for the management of hemolysis samples we can have such a criteria that we will not accept any hemolysis sample at all in the lab but if our criteria is that we will accept samples and then record the degree of hemolysis and take the call accordingly this is a useful algorithm which we can follow so once we get the hemolysis sample in the lab we quantify the hemolysis and see whether it is clinically significant or not if it is not clinically significant then we can do the analysis and report the results if yes it is clinically significant then we see whether the analytes asked for are affected by the hemolysis or not if not affected we can do the analysis but what we do is we perform the tests but we report the results with a warning however if we see that the analytes would be affected by hemolysis then we do not perform the analysis at all and a fresh sample is requested now coming to lipemia now lipemia classically is defined as a result of circulating chylomicrons which are large lipid particles accounting for characteristic turbid to opaque milky appearance of serum they cause interferences by turbidity or light scattering and volume displacement light scattering raises the absorbance of the blank and thereby reduces the operating scale for colorimetric methods and the biggest interference in terms of lipemia are the largest size particles which is the chylomicrons which have a diameter of 70 to 1000 nanometer and they classically cause maximum interference they are the main culprit now what are the chief causes of in vivo lipemia which is not so much in our control they can be the inherited hypertriglyceridemias in case of acute pancreatitis patient in uncontrolled diabetes mellitus in patients receiving parenteral nutrition in hypothyroidism in glycogen storage disorders in vivo lipemia can be seen in all of these now coming to the grades of lipemia depending on the extent of the triglyceride present the serum would appear more and more turbid more and more milky white appearance and a frankly white appearing serum usually the triglyceride level is more than 1000 to 1500 mg per dl so how does lipemia actually interfere there are four ways in which it can do it one is by simple presence that is mechanical interference interference in the measuring wavelength that is spectral interference volume displacement 
that is the electrolyte exclusion effect we will come to that and non homogeneity of the sample so what is spectral interference it affects all the spectrophotometric measurements because lipoprotein particles they absorb light across a wide spectra unlike hemoglobin which has a specific absorption maxima at 450 nanometer lipoprotein particles can absorb at any wavelength between 300 to 700 nanometer and that covers the uv range and potentially the entire visible spectrum so the peak height correlates with the triglyceride concentration and it is basically a dose dependent interference that is higher the level of triglyceride present more is the interference and it is maximum common phenolites where there is the lambda max or the absorption maxima that is the wavelength for measuring is the uv wavelength 340 nanometer many reactions utilize this particular equation that is conversion of the nadp plus to the nadph and h plus which this reaction has a lambda max of 340 nanometer and maximum interference by lipemia occurs at this particular wavelength and in case of light uh, those analytes which are measured by light scattering that is by nephelometry or turbidimetry presence of the big big uh, chylomicron particles in the serum cause intense scattering at the shorter wavelengths and affect all of those measurements now coming to the volume displacement that is the electrolyte exclusion effect so normally plasma consists of approximately 92 to 93% water and 7 to 8% lipids in case of lipemic sample this lipid percentage can go up to very high percentages it may be 25 to even 30% or even more and so this affects the analytes which are distributed in the aqueous phase say if the lipid component is now 25% the components which are distributed in the aqueous phase they have to be distributed within the 75% and classically the analytes which are most affected as a result of this are the electrolytes that is sodium potassium chloride particularly with in case of sodium this is seen so it interferes in electrolyte measurement by indirect potentiometry because in those measurements sample dilution is required so already the amount of the electrolytes available in the aqueous phase is less because 25% to 30% has already been taken up by the lipid segment now since the sample requires dilution if more diluent is added even less of the electrolyte recovery is now going to be the case because the sample dilution is even more so as a result very false low values are obtained and it is most pronounced with severely lipemic samples where the tg level is as high as 1500 mg per dl or even more however this interference is totally negated when we go for direct potentiometry because in those samples we don't require sample dilution so even in the presence of lipemia we will not get such false low values for our electrolytes so if we see this diagram it very nicely explains the electrolyte exclusion effect now what happens in this electrolyte exclusion effect is that in a normal plasma we can see 92% is water and 8% lipid our report is coming to 145 mL equivalent per liter in a normal plasma now if we correct for the actual aqueous phase distribution we will see that the value is 158 mL equivalent per liter so actually we are under reporting a bit even under normal circumstances however when the lipemic plasma is there or the lipemic serum is there the aqueous phase is contracted to only 75% so now the electrolytes are distributed in a much lower or in a much more contracted aqueous phase if we now add diluent as is required in case of indirect potentiometry the the loss of the electrolytes in so much of the water phase is even more so the recovery is even less so falsely we are seeing 118 mL equivalent per liter in a in the same patient where his sodium is absolutely normal but he is now having hyperlipidemia the value is coming to 118 mL equivalent per liter which is actually critically low sodium so this is a false low value thinking it to be the true value excess sodium may be given to the patient however if we correct for the 
aqueous phase and we divide that 118 by 0.75 like previously we will see that it is exactly 158 so his actual value is 158 milliequivalent per liter but because of the aqueous phase contraction and subsequent dilution the recovery is so poor that it is being under reported severely as 118 milliequivalent per liter and thinking it to be critically low sodium more and more sodium may be given as therapy and in already he is 158 which is actually almost critically high value after giving excess sodium we can only imagine what the condition would be so it's a very important to note that in cases of hyperlipidemic serum or plasma always we advocate the use of direct potentiometry where such interference where such false low values would not be seen otherwise it can be catastrophic for the patient the third thing is the non-homogeneity of the sample so after centrifugation the lipoprotein particles they distribute according to their density chylomicrons and vldl that is the very low density lipoprotein having the lowest density as their name suggests they are located at the top of the tube forming a distinct layer when sampling for measurement most of the analyzers they obtain sample from the upper part of the tube so what happens is that once the upper part of the tube is utilized all these chylomicrons and vldl they come up and they can lead to false decrease concentration of the electrolytes and other metabolites and lastly mechanical interference by lipemia this is interference in the electrophoretic analysis that is example is the abnormal morphology of the alpha 2 globulin fraction why because these chylomicron or the vldl particles those lipoproteins would also migrate along with the proteins of interest also non specifically they interfere in various immunoassays and lipoproteins they can interfere with immunoassays how by binding to the sites where the antigen antibodies would bind and thereby blocking those sites and such interference can lead to both false elevated or false decreased results so what are the analysis affected by lipemia we get false low values due to the electrolyte exclusion effect obviously for the electrolytes maximum interference is seen for sodium at triglyceride level equal to greater than 150 also chloride potassium bicarbonate the values need to be slight much higher but nevertheless the interference is there falsely elevated values are seen in case of direct bilirubin and tibc that is the total iron binding capacity now how we can detect the lipemia the commonest is simply through naked eye estimation visual detection this is the commonest approach and this is possible if the serum triglyceride is more than 300 milligram per dl we will see frank turbidity more difficult if the sample is whole blood because in whole blood this turbidity is masked it is much easier to see it in case of serum or plasma this is unreliable of course because it's eye estimation only and it has got poor reproducibility with automated detection we can actually measure the triglyceride level it gives a rough assessment so there is actually an inequitable distribution of triglyceride in chylomicrons and vldl the chylomicron contains the exogenous or the dietary triglycerides and the VLDL contains the endogenous triglycerides but the percentage of triglycerides is different in both. So chances of false positive results due to presence of both exogenous and endogenous glycerol in serum because glycerol remains in combination with the fatty acids to give the triglycerides so we have to take into account the interference by glycerol itself. Third way is the best way that is the automatic detection or the automated detection using the li or the lipemic index because lipemic samples they show maximum absorbance around 700 nanometer and there are several automated platforms available at low cost and at high speed they they can give you the results how much interference due to the triglycerides due to the lipemia is actually there only thing is there is a chance of false positive results when the cause of turbidity is anything other than lipemia that is in case of the paraproteinemias which is classically seen in patients of the plasma cell dyscrasias so how can we manage the lipemic samples we can extract out the lipids we can centrifuge and we can go for sample dilution so lipemia can be managed classically by these methods centrifugation it effectively removes the lipid particles by ultra centrifugation which is centrifugation at extremely high speeds see 100,000 to 200,000 g 
VLDL clearance is less effective and it requires repeated rounds. The infranitent, that is the portion lying below, is usually taken for analysis, but this is not suitable for fat soluble analytes. That those are not uh, advocated to be used after such centrifugation. Second method is the extraction using polymeric polar organic solvents like polyethylene glycol or cyclodextrin. These reagents they bind the lipids and form a pellet on centrifugation, so they pull it down so the supernatant can be used for analysis. However, the following analytes, inorganic phosphate, CKMB, GGT, CRP, those are also extracted out so you cannot measure those. And sample dilution is one of the best ways to remove the lipemia and done when the analyte to be measured is usually in the lipid phase and the sample is diluted enough so that the turbidity can be removed. Classically and very interestingly, an in-house way of removing uh, lipemia through sample dilution, which we have successfully done in our setup also, is to use a serum sample containing albumin at levels more than 3.5 gram per dl because albumin is a natural polarizer of lipids. So if that albumin sample can be added to the lipemic sample, that albumin in the after addition would effectively remove the interference by the lipemia and of course we have to correct for the dilution thus occurred and we can actually report the results. Liver enzymes like ALT and AST are classically very much susceptible to interference by lipemia so but in we may need to it may be absolutely necessary to report such samples. In such a case, we can dilute those samples with a serum sample where albumin is more than 3.5 gram per dl. 4 to 4.5 gram per dl of albumin is ideal. And after dilution, we rerun the samples and we subtract that obtained value from the value given by the normal serum with the albumins and then correct for the dilution factor. And results are very much reproducible and it can be reported. So interference testing in case of lipemia is an obligation of the manufacturers of the laboratory reagents and the best approach includes comparison of the tested method with the reference method that is the one on which lipemia has no influence and these are assessed by comparing the results and calculating the percentage bias between the two methods. So it often involves spiking of the native sample with some interference in order to create lipemia and then the measurement is done and that is subtracted from the non-lipemic initial sample and the bias is calculated. And this can be presented graphically on interferograms. And this is a typical interferogram where they have first done using different grades of reagent. They have first done a non-lipemic sample then spiked the sample and done the absorbances and they have seen what is the percentage bias between the non-spike sample and the spike samples at different concentrations using the different reagents and accordingly they have signified the criteria of acceptance or rejection. Now there is quite a simple algorithm for the management of lipemic samples. Once the sample comes to the lab, the degree of lipemia that is the L index is assessed by measuring the triglyceride level. Then the degree of lipemia is compared with the what tests are being requested, whether those tests would potentially be interfered upon by the lipemia. Now there are two possibilities. Either the lipemia doesn't influence the requested test, in which case the measurements and subsequent reporting can be done normally. <coughs> Sorry. Or lipemia influences the requested test, in which case we have to have in place a particular removal protocol depending upon which tests have been requested for. So we can either go for centrifugation that is ultra centrifugation or we can go for extraction using an agent like polyethylene glycol or we can go for a suitable diluent such as albumin like I was talking about earlier. So the, again there are two possibilities after employment of the particular technique either the interference is removed in which case we can go ahead with the reporting or the interference is not removed in which case testing has to be suppressed. Now coming to icterus. 
Now, icterus is classically defined as yellowish discoloration of body tissues resulting from the deposition of bilirubin. Hyperbilirubinemia is any level of serum bilirubin more than 1 mg per dl, which either may be of unconjugated type, which is predominantly seen in hemolytic conditions, or conjugated type, which is predominant mainly in obstructive and hepatocellular conditions. Now, this slide just shows the way bilirubin is formed. I will not spend too much time on it. This is fairly common knowledge and the way that bilirubin is metabolized. And there are three types of jaundice. We know that the prehepatic or the hemolytic, the hepatic or the hepatocellular and the post-hepatic or the obstructive type. Now, regarding the reference interval for serum bilirubin, these are the levels, the total bilirubin, the unconjugated and the conjugated. And degree of icterus can be defined as 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus or 4 plus, depending on the bilirubin level of 2.5, 5, 10 and 20 milligram per dl. Now, which are the analytes which are affected by icterus? Since icterus is an inherent pathological condition of the patient, this is an interference with, which we cannot actually avoid. But we need to know which are the analytes which are affected by it. So, false low values are seen with in case of total protein and triglycerides when bilirubin is equal to or exceeds 11 mg per dl, cholesterol and creatinine at levels of bilirubin equal or greater than 16 mg per dl, GGT and uric acid, lipase, these are all affected at much higher levels of bilirubin. Otherwise, for practical purposes, they remain unaffected. So, these are the analytes which show false low values whenever there is high bilirubin in the serum sample. So, what are the mechanisms by which icterus affects? One is spectral because bilirubin being a colored compound in itself shows a strong absorbance between 400 to 540 nanometer. The lambda max is usually at 450 to 460 nanometer. At the same time, bilirubin is a dye binding substance. It is a reducing substance by nature and it also causes destruction of several reaction intermediates. All in all, the combined effect, both spectral and non-spectral or chemical effect, is to cause a negative interference that is give falsely lowered values to analytes for which bilirubin acts as interferent. So the strategies which are employed to overcome interference by icterus, they can be of the following types. Addition of potassium ferricyanide to the reaction medium. This being an oxidizing agent oxidizes bilirubin to biliverdin and can overcome both the spectral as well as the chemical interference. Alternatively, the sample can be incubated with bilirubin oxidase. The enzyme achieves the same purpose, but it is cumbersome and costly. Use of dry chemistry platforms, which use a masking and a spreading layer, actually sequester or separate the bilirubin away from the actual reaction medium. So this is a very good alternative. And special layers on dry chemistry slides are there to overcome the interference by the icterus. And this is just a chart showing the visual spectra of the three major interference, hemoglobin, chylomicrons, and the bilirubin. Paraproteinemia remains the last area where potential interference can occur. So, the interference by paraproteins is that paraproteins are very much high in patients who are suffering from monoclonal gammopathies like multiple myeloma and they interfere by raising the viscosity of serum so that the fluid phase is reduced. So, they also exhibit the electrolyte exclusion effect like lipemia. They precipitate de novo during the testing procedure. They form macro complexes with enzymes because inherently these are abnormal immunoglobulins we are talking about. And at the same time, because of these are antibodies, they grossly interfere in immunoassays by the hook effect, a condition of antibody excess. And they can cause both positive as well as negative interferences. So bilirubin, amylase, creatine kinase, LDH, these give false high values in the presence of paraproteins, while electrolytes, HDL, these give false low values in the presence of paraproteins. And this is just a curve which exhibits the hook effect, a phenomenon of antibody excess, wherein the actual antigen antibody complexes are totally masked by the excess antibodies, 
and the signal is totally uh, depleted and a false low value for the analytes is obtained and this can be overcome by simple dilution of the sample which overcomes the hook effect and the actual value of the analyte can be reported and what are the strategies for overcoming interference by paraproteins either ultrafiltration separation of the paraproteins in a separate layer that is segregation in dry chemistry platforms this is done easily treatment of the sample with detergents which precipitate the paraproteins out or treatment with trichloroacetic acid which achieves the same purpose so that is all these are few of the references if you have any queries on today's topic you can always email me or address your questions in the question answer segment thank you all for your patient listening and hope to see you again with a fresh topic from the palm module thank you